we are in Sukkot in Florida. And as you see, I have my lulav and my a truck, and we're enjoying this time here in the sukkah. And if you look around, you can see we have the very typical uh, Florida weather this time of year where it's raining, but it's sunny, but it wants to rain, but there are clouds. And so we enjoy the sukkah in between raining, in between storms, and that's the way it is here in Florida. But I wanted to uh, uh, give you this much for this week. We go through the Torah portion. So this week we're kind of getting ready to close everything out and go back in the next week. We're just going to start the cycle all over again. So this week is Vazot Habracha. So Vazot Habracha is, and this is the blessing. And normally it's talk about the blessing to each tribe and how all the tribes receive blessings. And, you know, we compare that to the blessings that Jacob gave to his sons and how uh, they, they're similar and how they're different and how things are prophetic and all these. And that's, that's awesome. That's a great teaching if you want to dive into it. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. And I'm not going to do a really long teaching here. But the idea is how all that starts. So, and this is the blessing. So how does the blessing start? What does Moshe say to the children of Israel? How does it start? Well, I think first off, we need to take a look at who he's referring to in the very beginning of the cycle. This is the blessing. What is the blessing? Is it just the individual blessings to each 12 tribes? Or was there a foundation that all of these blessings were built on? I think that's the thing that we want to focus on. That's the thing that we want to look at. If we look in Deuteronomy, Devarim, and we go to chapter 33, we see this is the blessing that Moshe, the man of God, spoke over the people of Israel before his death. The first thing I find interesting about this is that the phrase Moshe, the man of God, this is the very first time this phrase was used in throughout the scripture, you know, a man of God. So it's, it reads, Moshe Ish Elohim. So this is the first time it was there. So when the first time this comes out, what is he referring to? I mean, he's been called other things. And other people throughout the scripture have been called a man of God, but this was the first time it was there. What does that mean for us? And I think the idea is, here he is, he's getting ready to bless all the tribes. He's getting ready to pass on what what our Father, our Heavenly Father, is giving to him to give to the people. And here he is standing as a man of God. He is kind of representing God to the people because this is what the Father told him and he is speaking to the people. So this is just like back to the burning bush kind of incident to where uh, Yahweh spoke to Moshe, Moshe spoke to Aaron, and they, then they spoke to the, to the uh, sons of Israel. So that's something that we can look at. He's standing as a man of God. He's representing the Father to the people and here he's about to speak a blessing to them. So how does this start? We read... This is the blessing. Adonai came from Sinai, from Seir. He dawned on his people, shone forth from Mount Sinai and uh, Paran, and with him were myriads of holy ones, and at his right hand was a fiery law for them. This phrase, fiery law, is pretty interesting. It's eshdat, and uh, if you look at it, eshdat, I mean, esh is fire. It's, it means fire or fiery or burning. And if you look at the Paleo Hebrew, it, it is the idea of pushing, strength that is pushing. Kind of like when you're building a fire, you take the sticks, you rub them together, and it's the, it's the strength and the pushing and the friction that causes the heat that causes the fire. And so again, esh, fire, it's, it's, it's the things being pushed together. And then dot is what we get for law. And for there, it translates as a, an edict, a statute, a commandment, a decree, something like that. But if you look at the picture, it is a door and a mark. So the door and a mark, if you look at the door and a mark, it's, it's to go through the door to see the mark. And, and again, it's a dalit and a tav. And the dalit is the door, you know, delit is a door, and then the tav is mark. And the ancient Paleo-Hebrew tav looks like a cross. And so it's to go through the door to see the mark. And Yeshua says, I am the door. And so he is the door that we can see the mark. And that's dot. And it's translated as law or ordinance. So esh dot, a fiery law or a fiery decree. Uh, what does this mean for us? Well, let's look at a couple other things. At his right hand was a fiery law for them. In Acts 7, verse 56, we see, look, he exclaimed, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Matthew twenty two forty four. 44, Adonai said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand till I put your enemies under your feet. Luke twenty two sixty nine 69 says, but from now on, the son of man will be sitting at the right hand of the Hagavrah or the power of Yahweh. Hebrews 1, 7 says, indeed, when speaking of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his servants fiery flames. First Corinthians three eleven through 13 says, no one is able to lay any other foundation beside the one having been laid, who is Yeshua, our Messiah. And if anyone builds on this foundation, what foundation? The foundation of Yeshua, our Messiah. 
uh, builds on this foundation, gold, silver, or precious stones, wood, grass, or straw. The work of each will be revealed, for the day will make it known, because it will be revealed in fire, and the fire will prove the work, each what sort it is. And so here we see the fire it was for a trial, the fire was to purify throughout Scripture, and the fire was to reveal uh, to, the, to the people of Israel what the Father desired for them, to burn out those things that don't belong there. And what stands and remains is pure gold, precious stones. In other words, all of, all of the works that the Father is giving us, all of his word that he's giving us, the segula, these precious treasures that he desires to give us, they're gems, they're jewels, and things that uh, we can take and receive for ourselves. The next thing I find very interesting is this. Verse 3 says, He truly loves the people. All his holy ones are in your hand. And then he says, Sitting at your feet, they receive instruction. Sitting at your feet, they receive instruction. I, do we really think about it this way? That the children of Israel, when they were at Mount Sinai, they were literally sitting at the feet of Yahweh. Sitting at the feet of our Heavenly Father. Sitting at his feet receiving teaching from him. This, you know, even in biblical days, we read how the, the, the Talmudim or the disciples would sit at the feet of their rabbi, how they would like sit and they would learn from their rabbi. Here, all Israel as one nation sat at the feet of the Most High. And what did he give them? He taught them. And so where does this idea come from? It's exactly what he did for us before. We read in Luke 8, 35, they went out to see what was done and they came to Yeshua and they found the man from whom the devils were departed and sitting at his feet... He was clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Mark 5, 22. Behold, there comes one of the rulers out of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Mark 7, 25. A certain woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him. They came and fell at his feet. So here's the idea that to falling, falling at his feet is to receive from him. Falling at his feet, to be sitting at his feet, is to receive teaching from him, to receive instruction from him. And this is what we're learning here. That at the foot of the mountain, they receive Torah, which is teaching and instruction. Verse 4. The Torah Moshe commanded us as an inheritance for the community of Yaakov. I think it's important to understand that the word that was given to us is an inheritance for us, and it was given to the community. Yes, it's given for each individual to be walked out, but it's given to a community because an individual walking out by themselves doesn't get that much accomplished. But when you have individuals walking together, doing what they're supposed to be doing with other individuals, it develops a community. And if we can develop the community of our Heavenly Father, then we can change the world. So one person at a time, just walking out as the Father desires, as His heart desires for us to walk, we can walk in His ways. And that's what we're learning day by day by day, as we're sitting at His feet at Sinai. So what we see is that the Torah is to be walked out by the individual, but within the community. We see Hebrews 10, 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Ephesians 2.12 That at that time you were without the Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were far off are now brought near by the blood of of Yeshua. So what we find here is, is sitting at his feet, we are brought near and we're brought as a community and we're brought as a people, but we're learning that our relationship in the community, yes, as individuals, we're not to make everybody exactly the same, but the idea is that we all have that same love towards one another. We all have the same desire to, to, to be with one another and to dwell with our Heavenly Father together. Continuing on, we read in verse 5, and Moshe was king or And he, Moshe, the shadow of the coming king, was king in Yeshurun. Yeshurun means upright ones. And then he says this, When the heads of the people and the tribes of Israel were gathered together. I think this is exciting because we see that when the king is in Yeshurun, all the tribes will gather together. Right now we have everybody trying to get away from everybody else. But as the king arises and we submit to his rule, we submit to his authority and his kingship, we will see people coming together, not just scattering. We will see the people coming together as the king arises within Yeshurun, which means the upright ones, the righteous ones. As the king, as the king arises, 
then people will be gathered together in him. Uh, Much like Yeshua said, if the Son of Man be lifted up, he will draw all people to him, much in the same way. This is what we're looking at in this Parsha, as as we have the King arise in our midst, as we glorify the one true King of kings and Lord of lords, then he will gather all the people together. In Psalm 133, 1, it says, Oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together, how? In harmony. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And I I believe we've talked before when we say in his name, it doesn't just mean that we speak his name. Now there he is. It's some kind of magic magic formula where poof, now he's here among us. Then the idea is as we're dwelling within his life and within his character and we come together, that just flows among us and and that unity that is there much like he's prayed in john chapter 17 father i pray that they are one like you and i are one and so that's the that's what we want that's our desire that's what we're looking for so if we continue in ephesians 4 we see i therefore the the prisoner of the lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation where you are called with all lowliness and meekness with long suffering forbearing one another in love and endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace There's one body and one spirit as you were called to one hope of your calling. You know, today we find that so many people saying, you know, would you rather be united in error or divided in truth? And and we're quick to throw that out because, I mean, I do agree with that. We're not to unite ourselves with error, but at the same time, just because someone doesn't see something the same way doesn't mean that we throw our brother aside. No, I don't think so. I think we need to learn to gather together because as as the king arises among us, are we declaring our unity in him, in his kingship, in his lordship, and walking as he desires? And that's our path. And until he actually comes and sets us all straight and corrects us all, we're working with the understanding that we've got. And all of us see things differently. We need to learn to dwell together in that. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, For as the body is one and many, and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are called one body. I think that's the idea. Even though we're scattered all over the globe, scattered all over the world, we need to learn what it looks like to be one body, one people in him. Because that's what we're going to be anyway. So when we see here, back to Psalm 133, it says, We're to dwell yachad. The interesting thing is Yahad spelled the same way we can say Yahid. Yahid, it's it says united, but the implication is beloved, like Matthew 3.17 says, my beloved son. So Yahad and Yahid are, are related or even same words. So how are we supposed to be Yahad? We're supposed to be Yahad in Yahid, the one beloved son that is reigning and ruling above all. So we see here in Revelation 5, 9, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals because you were slaughtered at the cost of your blood, ransomed for God, persons from where? Every tribe, language, people, and nation. Verse 10, you made them into a kingdom for God to rule, Kohanim to serve him, and they will rule over the earth. Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, they love not their lives unto death. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith in Yeshua. I think that's what we need to strive for. We need to learn to keep God's word, but to do it as Yeshua taught us how to do it. Yeshua did not come to teach us how to not keep God's word. Yeshua came to teach us how to keep the word of his Father. And so we need to learn to dwell together. Yeshua says, if you're not gathering with me, you're scattering. And I think that's something we can take in our daily lives. Are we gathering the people or are our actions scattering everybody? We need to look to see if we're doing that. We need to see if we are gathering or scattering. Because the heart of the Father, and this is the blessing that goes forth to all the tribes, that we gather together. Even in our uniqueness, even in seeing things differently, even in the different personalities, we need to learn to gather together in Him. I think we can agree with that. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, that's what we have for this week. So a blessing for you all. I hope you're enjoying the Torah cycles and the portions and looking forward to starting over again soon. Bless you. Shalom. 
Well, if this teaching has blessed you, I want you to check out our other resources. You can check out our website at www.ruachonline.com. And there's links there to other resources that are available to you, other teachings, other books, other offerings. Uh, you can go to YouTube, Facebook, all of these things from our website and uh, check us out. Because if they enjoyed this teaching, there's going to be much more that hopefully will bless you as well. Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. David Jones from Ruach Ministries International, and I've got some exciting news for you. We have a new series coming out, six-part series of the Gospel According to Abraham. Abraham? What does he got to do with the Gospel? Well, you're going to have to find out, aren't you? The thing is, Galatians 3 says that the Gospel was proclaimed to Abraham. So what does that mean for a believer today? What does that mean to a person who is not Jewish? What does that mean to a person who is Jewish? What does that mean for all of us today? Well, check it out. It's a good series and it'll be coming your way soon. For more information, you can check out our website at www.ruachonline.com. Hi, this is Dr. David Jones here. I just want to say we do have some other resources available to you, one of which is a book entitled Famine, Walking and Blessing in the Time of Famine. It's based out of Amos 8, 11, and 12, talking about there's a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. So what is that famine? Does it mean the word of the Lord is not being proclaimed, or does it mean there's a famine of actually listening to it? Hmm. Food for thought, isn't it? Well, if you want to know more, check it out. Go to www.ruachonline.com and there's a link on our homepage. Just click and it'll take you to more information on the book entitled Famine, Walking in Blessing in a Time of Famine. Well, how important are the feasts of the Lord? I think we can say that if the Lord set out a banquet, set out a table and invited you to come be a partaker, would we answer? Would we hear? Would we go? Or would we blow them off because we have something more important to do? Well, that's what this book is. The king invites you to his table. Are we going to answer the call? The feast of the Lord, appointed times where the Lord has said he wants to meet with us face to face. Will we heed? Will we answer? Will we go? Check it out, www.ruachonline.com. On the homepage, there is a link to take you for more information. The King invites you to his table.